welcome to the Sim City Social Club for Friday, April 30th. We're glad to see you. Today's Social Club is different than our usual. We have a Q&A session about the big battalions, which several of us watched in a, um, a screening series over the last few weeks, uh, courtesy of Channel 4 and with Emma Shaw, who helped make that happen. This is a mini series that aired in Britain in 1992. It was Sid's first big on-screen role. And um, we have, we're delighted to have with us today, uh, Hugh Stoddart, who is the screenwriter of The Big Battalions. So I'm gonna leave it to Sid to do further introductions there. Great, lovely, thank you, thank you. Well, Hugh gets his um, lighting sorted out. Um, yes. I, watched, I watched it the other day and um, I was just amazed at how well it stood up. I mean, the technology, we, it, it looks like it's shot in, you know, on a not quite what we're used to HD versions and stuff all that, like that but it's still just wonderful and beautiful and the and, and the director I think whose name you correct me if I'm wrong uh Hugh is Dominic Greaves Andrew Andrew Greaves Andrew Andrew Greaves mm -hmm. that's it mm -hmm. okay great um did a wonderful job um mm -hmm. and we were talking about um the the producer of it called Brian Eastman who ran a, a company called Carnival Films famous for Jeeves and Worcester and Poirot and um, loads of other wonderful things, um, who he was just telling me, just came up with meta ideas like religion or medicine or, and just said to Hugh, right, give me a show about religion. And Hugh had to go away and do the, the con make, conceive of a, a plot for you know six hours of uh, huge religious TV. <laughs> Um, but anyway, you're all you're all really welcome, um, and uh, um, I don't know if we'll get to talk to anybody as we normally do because I think we'll just chat about big talents and some of the themes that it brings up. And um, it's kind of in our in our in our area. We like talking about this sort of stuff, um, and uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here with us. You, thank you, thank you. Very happy to answer any questions about anything to do with it that uh, if I can help. Uh, absolutely but let's talk talk about if you could just to start how how i mentioned brian eastman who was the, the producer picked up the phone and said look i want to do a show about religion how, how long did he give you what what did he how did he help you what because you just started with a blank canvas well i did in a way i mean he 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 very much wanted he felt it needed to kind of focus on the three major monotheistic religions that is would be therefore Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. You know, so yeah. um, that was like. So then, the, so really, a lot of the there were two things that I needed to do. One was a great deal of research, you know, to to um, understand what what a charity worker would be involved in in Ethiopia. So I went to Ethiopia to understand more about the the fraught situation in what was then called the occupied territories. So I went there, you know, and I wanted to understand what it would be like to be a cons conscript in the Israeli army. So I talked to people who were conscripts in the Israeli army. And, and it, it was really about trying to build the connections. So how could convincingly we move from one of these places to another? And I focused yeah. on Ethiopia because it is one of the most ancient sites of Christian belief. Research leads to wonderful things. Like I realized that there was this very important festival called Epiphany that happens at a particular time in the year in Ethiopia. And so then I started to have a structure. I thought, well, maybe we can go from one Ethiopia at the beginning of the, of the, of the series and end with it a year later with another. Um, right. And that gave me a kind of structure. And also what was another thing that was going on was that there was a war going on in Ethiopia. I was about was to mention. Drawing to a close. So I thought I re was revising the script as the war was ending. And then I built the end of the war into the final part. So it was literally right. just happening. And therefore the people who were the victorious Eritrean troops were then extras when we were shooting the scenes of them kind of moving their tanks into Addis and my so goodness mm -hmm. um so you basically have two wars just ending in your show and you send your characters to Ethiopia and to Israel yes. how difficult was that I mean do, are we are were you part of the I mean I know you weren't in the producing team but nevertheless you would have heard from Brian all the time 
mm. how difficult was it actually sending because there was an authenticity must have been mm. top of the list about getting because otherwise i wouldn't have been hired by the way but it was um how difficult was it to send people to all these places mecca jerusalem mm. ethiopia during wars well, I mean, obviously, I didn't have a lot to do with the actual preparation, pre-production, production and all those headaches, because I'd yeah. done my work by then. But yeah. um, what I think was so what what is really what I can more convincingly talk about is how to make those characters convincing, given the extraordinary circumstances they find themselves in. So, yeah. you know, it's like Martha is a very English kind of person and how is she coping as a charity worker on the front line and I, yeah. I wanted her to sound like she really knew her stuff it's, it's all those things which come from research and meeting people and, and yeah. all of that you know but I mean yes there were there were a lot of production headaches and and, and Andrew there said, must have been he, Andrew said oh he said dealing with all these religious institutions was a nightmare couldn't film here and he couldn't film there and they were picking over the script and they didn't like this and didn't like that. So, you know, he, he was really quite gung ho in, in being very resistant to, not to faith, but to faith as embodied in institutions, which was sort yeah. of part of the, the drama in a way. Yeah, I mean, what I loved about, one of the things I loved about it, and I'm sure people will bring it up, was that you don't disrespect religion, um, but you do, you know, have it in for people you don't think, of, uh, you think of bent cops in the religious world, for, for, for one of a better way of putting it. And yeah. you, you, especially for the Anglican church, which you think, which you depict as a corrupt institution, um, a, a dinosaur uh, has been, in fact, I think you even talk about that in, in the first couple of episodes. It's well, sort of, it's over. Yes, I mean, it, it was, it was at the time caught up in terrible internal dissension which was mostly about women being vicars and priests in the church. And there, there was yeah. terrible fraught disagreement about that. The big thing for me was when I decided that I wanted a cleric who'd lost his faith. That, yeah. that to me was the, that was the moment when I thought I can crack this because once I had that, I had somebody who was internally in crisis and yeah. that would, that would sort of, whereas Martha had become skeptical about missionaries, but she still was sustained. She is sustained by a belief yeah. that she can do something good. You know? yeah, and that's absolutely. the kind of faith that I wanted us to be left with. It was, it was really touching. I think that, that came through very, very loud and clear. Um, and in all, the mon in all the religions that you discuss, you talk about, I mean, the character I played is clearly a lost child. Um, Mm -hmm. and very easily destroyed you know very very vulnerable boy mm -hmm. um punching a bit above his weight as an architect i think yes, yes. um <laughs> you know, he was a bit young to be an entirely credible architect uh, but he was still but that kind of lent to his vulnerability he, he felt mm -hmm. he, he felt a, a little bit like a a, a a boy in short pants at, at, a, at a, a very adult party which he and he was totally eaten alive by everybody yes and his need to go off and find himself yes yeah, so because his no, father no, no. wanted to keep him away from islam absolutely i understand and he found that he kind of wasn't really quite accepted in the white world that he'd been grown raised in where would he go and of course it was the idea that faith is has a sort of cultural power it, it's something that can sustain you because you yeah. think this is, this is who I am. And um, actually, because one question I think came up was filming in Mecca. And quite an important scene is where he meets this Palestinian who, do you remember, you, you meet this guy and he says, you must go, you must go and see your mother. And he says, you know, how Palestinians end up in airports and waiting and they have no papers and they're stateless and how hard it is he says you've got a british passport you must go and see your mother in palestine you know yeah and and that yeah. sort of sense of you of, of finding himself as you say is, is very important and yeah it's quite thing, prophetic because of the way that the 9-11 turned out i mean that was obviously pre-9-11 and our 
I suppose our idea, our notions of what terrorism were was mm -hmm. changed because of time 9-11. Um, there was a, a serious sort of element of it was there was definitely terrorism before then, um, a, mm -hmm. a Islamic terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, but this, the kind of you've got a you've got a sense of understanding of knowing how people become radicalized. But on, in today's spotlight, that would be a very different story. He'd be a much more dangerous human being. He would have gone off to join ISIS, you know, he would. and that's a m much more frightening concept now. Mm -hmm. No, he 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 wants to he wants the best of Islam as a yeah. sustaining, inspiring, sort of wonderful yeah. thing where everybody gathers together. You know, yeah. um, that that's what he wanted from Islam, and and the, those rather kind of unkind guys who cut his face. You know, remember? Those guys, yes, they, in the, they in are hostile. they are they they sort of taken a different route, and they they see Islam as something that they're going to fight exploit. For, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, well, let's open it up to see if people want to have a chat yeah. about it. We have some questions that have been submitted by folks who uh, would rather not be in the spotlight. So let me let me run through a couple of those. The title comes from a quote, but we've been wondering which <laughs> quote, because there's two versions. Yes. There's the, the Voltaire quote, which is God is on not on the side of the big battalions. And then there's the alternate, which is Providence, is on the side of the big battalions. So did you purposely make it that ambiguous? I sort of com combined the two, I think, actually. <laughs> I'm not sure now whether I did that by mistake or because I was being trying to be too clever. But I, I think what I liked was um, the idea that in warfare, people want God on their side, and they all claim God's on their side. Um, there's a very famous scene, well, it's a very famous play called Journey's End. Um, it's a British play about the First World War. And this disillusioned guy in the trenches, um, and he says, you know, we're, we're supposed to have God on our side. He said, but I'm telling you, the Germans think God's on their side. And he said, they've got Gott mit uns, and it's on their belts. It's holding their trousers up. And I just thought it was such a wonderful line, you know. And um, so I think it's that idea that God's on the winning side, you know, and if, if you're defeated, you stop talking about God. I just thought it was a great title too, actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> the big battalions. <laughs> it is, but it also mm. then feeds into the fact that the, at the very end, we don't have, I mean, obviously Yusuf has a pretty definitive uh, mm. period on his story arc, but our other main characters are just, um, it's a really disparate series mm. of not quite conclusions for each of the characters. So again, it's um, this a series of ambiguous endings mm. to the very different character arcs and I think where they are in as far as their faith. Because the daughter, as she goes into the convent, yeah. to sort of heal up, you know, Gil kind of, you know, confesses this terrible thing he's done. And I think you feel that he maybe can find his way back to to what sustained him before, you know, um, because he's seen um, his own kind of faith become distorted and cruel, you know. There is this very strange scene at the end, which I think Jane Lapater didn't like at all, where she, she goes to see Yared and he comes out with this extraordinary, entirely sort of mystical statement that you know, God is not in us, we are in God. God is everything and everything around us. And we flow in God's blood, which is a very strange thing. Uh, I'm amazed I got away with it, really. What I was trying to say is that perhaps God is the sort of repository for everything that is too grand and too huge and too amazing for us to encompass. And so that's, we put it in this, this thing that we call God. And I think that's, yeah. that's kind of where I felt the only place I could leave, leave it, leave the whole issue of, of faith, which after all is not a rational thing, something else. It's something that some of us need very badly and others of us don't. I think that idea of faith as being something fragile and that you can't always hold on to it was something that I brought to it from my own experience. Well, on that note, I'm going to bring Geneva on, and Geneva is um, a minister. Hi. Hello, Geneva. It's lovely Hi to there. see you again. 
Hello, Sid. I'm very glad you made it to Australia in one piece. Thank you, sweet. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Hugh, for taking the time. I could absolutely listen to you unpack this for a very long time. Um, but yes, so within that, that I, I very much appreciate that understanding of um, religion that has to have doubt involved because um, faith that has certainty is no longer faith. It, it, it is simply certainty. Um, and, you know, coming from Christianity, we have a whole faith in things that we have not seen, the concept, and that matters. But you're absolutely right that this is something that religions are things um, from which people will die, from which people will kill, from which people will, will change the intensity of how they relate to other folks. And one of the things that I found very interesting in the narratives that you created was that Yared's arc to him returning to being a priest was only possible after he took a life in order to save another. Mm. So I, I was wondering, because especially within the Abrahamic religions, sacrifice is such an important piece of the narrative of how people function religiously. Um, and in the, the narrative of acting out faith, sacrifice becomes a thing of like of whether it's you're serving in the army you have to sacrifice your time whether it's you're um becoming part of this um house church that you you sacrifice your ideas about other things or whatever it is that the narrative of sacrifice underlies all of these things and i was wondering how um especially in the in the early 90s when globally things were starting to shift how you were considering sacrifice when you were writing this, if at all, or if I'm just reading a lot of sermons into this, because that's what I want to do with this show. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll now all be quiet for two minutes while we um, think about this. Um, well, Yared, Yared, I was very fond of Yared, and, and I, he, he is a, he does play out the, the same issue that you talked about, the, you know, power as opposed to faith, and he's driven into the wilderness, really by the Ethiopian government who wants to force the church to back the government and they won't back them. Um, and I think the moment when, I can't remember how I arrived at the moment when he shoots the, the, the kind of bandit guy is perhaps a moment when he, it's that moment of choice when you, you know, there's, you have to do something and what are you going to do, you know, in a situation like that. And, um, I think a lot of drama has those moments and it's when we we still care about a character although they've done something terrible because we understand what's driven them to it because he's been through this awful time of wandering with these awful people and, and unable to get back to 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 the um, monastery where which is sort of his spiritual source and so on he's seen Martha suffer he's seen this naive American kind of more or less murdered in a way because the, they just drive him and drive him, make him walk and walk and walk until he, he it's a kind of march of death really. Um, and that's the moment when he, he, he'll pick up a gun and use it. And I think those are the moments we, we understand. To be honest, I, don't, I was more thinking about moral choices rather than sacrifice actually. Um, but it's, it's interesting, I, I'm, I'm intrigued that you, Presented, presented that idea because, you know, we're not always conscious about what we're doing when we're writing things, because I'm, I'm certainly not, you know, because I, I've, I've not had any training for this, you know what I mean? I just fell into it. This is the first series I'd ever written. So I just kind of feeling my way, do you know what I mean? And sometimes you do things because you think, yeah, that works, that works. I want that to happen, you know, but you may not know necessarily quite why it's working because I don't, I don't start from theoretical positions or analysis. It's all, it's very intuitive what I do. I think. How did you get your first break? How did you, what was your first thing that-, that Oh, that, what, uh, oh, well, no, actually <laughs> what happened was um, right at the beginning, I was very young and there was this other guy who made documentaries and he wanted to move into drama and he realized he couldn't really do it. And he discovered that I was actually a writer already Quietly, I've been encouraged by the Royal Court Theatre and this and that. So, so we started to talk about a film and he quickly realised that I was coming up with ideas which were going to make it work, you know. 
And we eventually found some money from somewhere outside television or cinema or anything, made this little film. It was, in fact, we wrote a script that we couldn't afford. So we just shot the first half and made that a film. And it was fantastic. <laughs> it was terribly successful. It was extraordinary. I don't know how it happened. We were in the London Film Festival and BBC bought it. And suddenly people thought, oh, who, is, who are these two guys no one's ever heard of living in the West Country, which I was then. And suddenly you have another idea and people say, oh, yes, how interesting. Do you know what I mean? So it was, yeah. it was making that film on a tiny budget rather than endlessly sending scripts and hoping someone will read them. It was about make just doing it, you know, which is Absolutely. what I still say to young writers, just do it, you know. That's a, such good advice. We've got a lot of young, very talented writers in, in the club that oh, we, right. we, we yeah. run. And yeah. uh, we, we were just talking to a young director writer last, mm. last week, um, mm. and she's making her second short movie. And, Great. And, yeah. and this is absolutely mm. the way this has to go. You do have to just get on with your mm. iPhone and, mm. you know, guerrilla film, make it on the corner mm. of a street if you have to in the middle of the night, mm. get shooed away mm. by the police and yeah. start again somewhere else. Yeah. It shaped me, really, because I teamed up with this guy who wasn't much of a writer, but was a very good director, you know. Um, yeah. We, we, had, we had some troubles later, but the two of us made six films in 10 years, you know, wow. because we were a partnership <clears throat> and people knew we were a partnership and they said, oh, it's Colin Gregg and Hugh Starbuck. Oh, well, better say yes. Do you know what I mean? Because we could deliver. Um, Absolutely. But that's unusual. Um, and it's often quite tough. If you just want to be a writer, you really need to try and find that person who wants to be a director because yeah. you need that person to, and then the two of you, a rope together, you know, and you, you, you st stops you falling off the mountain, really, you know. Along those lines, Hugh, do you remember sure. what the contemporary reception was of the big battalions? But when I, when <laughs> I, I dug out all the reviews, because I've got quite a lot here, the great majority were pretty good, actually, pretty good. I think um, because it was tough for me in the years afterwards, I didn't get anything else happening for a while and so on. I thought, well, maybe people hadn't liked it, but the reviews are actually much better than I'd remembered them. Of the people who didn't like it, mostly they just said, oh, I can't keep up, where are we? You know, are we, are we in Palestine or are we in, are we in, you know, uh, Bridport? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It was a yeah. sort of, and I think that sort of jumping from story to story was perhaps something that with hindsight, I, I would have resisted. Um, but, you know, the worry, worry is to, keep an audience interested in that crucial first half hour, three quarters of an hour. So we don't want too much in foreign places and, and yet you're trying to get the stories going. And these were the things that some, some of the critics didn't buy into. But mostly I think people were interested by the, by the scale of it, by the ambition of it, I think, which, yeah. was, which was great. You know, it's ironic, of course, that every show now is that complex. It does, every show jumps around from does it? Pillar to post. Yes. Oh yes. gosh, it's, it it's now it's that was just yeah. a forerunner. Uh, it was mm. one of the one of the shows that kind of maybe made it possible. There's a mm. as a reference. Like, well, there's, we do a, we do, we talk a lot about that sort of stuff in the club and right. some of the TV shows right. we've loved from back in the day that set blazed trails um, mm. and ended mm. up to, and got us to where we are now. And that was very definitely one of them. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. This was a uh, pre pre internet really so I don't know did you ever have a sense of what the um, the popular conversation was around it or were you did you have to just rely on the critics. Yeah, you, you, there wasn't really a way to access that I mean you'd hear sort of fascinating stories I mean one person who had a, a, a Muslim guy who was living living in the flat next door who was gobsmacked who just couldn't believe that he was watching this on his British television, you know? And, and there were people like that who I think were really, really amazed that here was a, a character who was going to Mecca, who was, you know, embracing this faith that they, they, that they were carrying with them often, you know, you know setting up you know, small mosques and places and, and kind of trying to hang in here. And, and, you know, and also the other extraordinary thing was how at that time, the main pressure on Muslims was simply to culturally join in. And their religion wasn't the issue. But of course, after 9-11, everyone decided that they, was, they might be secretly planning something bad. To me. So a lot of young people 
subsequent to 9-11 started to, you know, wear the hijab, they started to go to mosques, they started to say, well, look, if you think I'm, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm Muslim, you've got a problem with that kind of thing. And all that came afterwards. At the time then, their worry was, you know, dad, I, I can't always be home at 10 o'clock at night, you know, and I do want to see this girl, but it's not serious. And all these kind of struggles that they would have because of cultural clash, really, with how they'd been raised and how they wanted to fit into British as young British. That's people. such a good point. That's yeah. such a good point. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think Ash has a, a more uh, logistical question for you. Yeah, I, I had a question as a, as a, as a writer, like, um, how do you get to um, re research for, for something that is so um, politically sort of charged, like to get to go into those areas and, and talk to people and stuff like that? Is it, is it, and is it possible on, with like, um, I guess, limited resources? I mean, I, I did have good resources. I mean, this thing was being funded. We were going into, you know, it was going to happen. And so I did have resources. I could go to Israel. I could, I could, I was given the contact of a journalist and she set up a series of interviews with people who would not be named. And it was understood that they would not be named, but they would come into the room. They'd sit in front of me as people who were in the Israeli army. And I would ask them things which they might or might not answer. <laughs> so that's a kind of really raw kind of research. But when I'm researching, I don't know what I'm looking for until I find it, you know. And when I did those interviews, there was one guy, the journalist was quite good. She, she found me a range of people. And there was one guy who was a real hardliner. And he said, I shoot them if I need to shoot them, you know. These people want to harm my, my people, you know, and he just didn't have any worries. I thought, oh, you know, I heard, I heard something in him. I thought, well, maybe I'm going to need somebody like that. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's real to me. I'm not just kind of laying my own sort of liberal sensitivities on, on the situation. These people feel this way. They passionately feel this way. So that's what you find out. Like when I spoke to someone who was involved in property development, and I said, do, do people get so angry that they might actually sabotage a development? And she said, oh, yes. Yeah, you would be careful. So I thought, right, OK. It's not crazy for me to have someone cause a serious accident because they just want to block the development of the spiritual center. You know, so those are things where you find out. And I would go, I went to Ethiopia and I talked to charity people there and um, for instance, I discovered somebody said, oh, yeah, yeah, someone someone threw a grenade into the Hilton Hotel. You know, so I thought, oh, that, that can happen. That can happen. You know, so I, I wanted that to happen because then I, I've got the grenade, but then what am I going to do with it? Oh, well, I'm going to have, you know, this person and this person and this person. And then you've got a kind of crisis that I could build around that idea that someone was when the country was in crisis that that kind of level of thing could happen so research as i say for me is, is is just looking and looking and searching and talking to people um and then you find that thing you want you, you might talk to somebody for a long time but you come away with that sort of that kind of lump that little thing and, oh yes that's, what I'm, that's, that's interesting so from in, in sorry ash and from uh, in in um uh, sort of answer to ash's question mm -hmm. Um, you can, in fact, uh, get some really decent research done with limited resources. Mm. Um, obviously, not as fancy as going to Israel or Ethiopia mm. and, you know, taking airplanes around the world. But as long as you start looking, you mm. might find what you're looking for, provided you understand you don't know what you're looking for mm. before you start, which is kind talking of ironic. To, but nevertheless. To, people are, I find people are always very happy to tell you what they do. So if you've got an idea for a film and it's about somebody who, who, for instance, works in the funeral trade, go and talk to somebody, just go knock on and say, look, might, might I be able to ask you some questions? I'm working on this film. And they'll say, oh, great, not now, I'm really busy. Let's fix the time. We'll go and have a cup of coffee and we'll talk. You know, people reveal extraordinary things 
that you won't find in books, you won't find in research in the kind of academic sense, you find it as a sort of, um, what's the word, there's a term for it, isn't there? A sort of anecdotal kind of material. Because then you're finding out what you could call a fact, but you're also finding out what makes people like this tick. And your characters, a character that you're forming starts to become a little, a little sharp around the edges, you see. Mm. So I, I wouldn't be intimidated by thinking of research as necessarily an expensive thing. It's about talking to people. Do you, do you come up with some idea of what you want to ask? I think it's very helpful to be curious about people. I mean, I'm, I'm very curious about people, you know, so I think um, I don't necessarily say, I don't interview them so much as just talk, ch chat, you know, and see what kind of comes up. And then I, you know, you sort of, you hunt, you're hunting their replies, if, if you like. That's very useful. <clears throat> Thanks, Ash. Yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I jumped right past. Jennifer had a question for Sid in your experience um, working on this project. I didn't forget you, Sid. Um, Not good. You just recently completed a role as a cleric of, of a different religion. And granted, that film wasn't really focusing on the religious tension, <laughs> to mm -hmm. my knowledge. But it, yeah. I mean, you haven't played a lot of religious types. Um, no, it's true. When you were doing this, and and you, this might be a question for you as well. Um, when Sid, you were you were playing this young kid who is finding religion, and years 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 later, you're playing um, someone who has found power and space. Like, how do you how do you bring your religious self because you are constantly having this conversation within yourself you and I have talked about yeah. it before. yeah um but because a religious role is kind of different than other roles um how do you bring yourself or deliberately keep yourself out of it depending on which power structure you're you're inhabiting as an actor well, that's a really good question I mean I was um a, I'm a naive child. I mean, for those who, who, who have seen some of my works, a lot of you have. Um, Deep Space Nine, the Bashir character, thank you, was, um, you can see the, the genesis of Bashir in Yusuf. You can see the same character. And this is a boy who's just two years younger than Bashir. But that's the, the guy, you know, pre-med pre school. And then Bashir is, is, post, is just after med school. But they're very similar characters in the sense that they're very uncertain, not sure of their footing, um, easily um, upset, you know, easily turned off their course, easily lose confidence. Um, and that was a really cool gift that uh, Hugh wrote because he wrote a character that I could inhabit as a person who was a very lacking confidence anyway. Um, so it was really easy for me to step into a role having no particular machismo to sell and um, that, and and it really, and like you, I was also a religious teenager, so it was very. There was a lot of autobiographical elements to that to that character, um, and it just dumb luck that Hugh had written that character and that I ended up in it and playing that that part. And he didn't have much choice about who to play that role, um, because there just simply weren't many British Muslim actors <laughs> that time. I'm always fascinated, especially with roles that do touch on the things that drive us in, in this way, that not only that they are difficult to write because you have to write from some knowledge um, and some opinion of your own in a way that you don't with, um, you know, if you were writing a story of a lava monster, there's a little bit less of yourself put into it. Um, <laughs> But to, to hear the way that, that it does impact you as a human in who, who is figuring out how to be human in the crazy way that, that religion asks considerably um, because this is so interwoven into our, our politics, into our culture, into ourselves over history. Um, so I, I and my remaining 607 questions are going to yield the floor, but thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, for Jennifer. Your time. I mean, there's there's an interesting thing there that, that you mentioned that the young actors particularly, 
um, as opposed to because you mentioned what happened when I'm now 55 and I'm doing you know playing playing a cardinal uh, just recently. So it, the young actors are are, autobi are autobiographical creatures. Mm. They they do what they know. They do themselves and they do it to the best of their ability. Um, very rarely do young actors do a good job outside of their frame of reference, their ex experience of life. <clears throat> And if you, your, your best shot is to get a young actor to do something that is similar to him or her or them. And it's once you get into that place, you've got a, a, a wealth of terrific actors to choose from. It's when you get older, you, you are and should be mining all sorts of other interesting areas and be able to play well beyond your realm of experience and all sorts of it. So, and, and hence, you know, the great actors tend to be pretty old, you know, generally older. Amy had a question. Uh, we kind of have heard about your experience filming in Mecca and how it's like a documentary or whatever. Um, when you were filming, you know, at, at like the Kaaba and everything, it, did you and the other actor have to go through all the rituals and prayers and stuff to make it look official? Or oh, yeah. worried about getting the shots? <laughs> no, we had absolutely to do everything right. Um, it was, uh, it's completely forbidden to film fiction in the cup in you know the, the grand mosque in mecca it's absolutely forbidden and had anybody realized we'd done that we did that they would have just stoned us right there on the spot um they caught someone with a camera a few weeks ago a german film crew and they had to be rescued by the security forces because they were going to just get killed they think any that that sort of disrespect is a capital offense so uh rad rawi who was the other actor and i um were fastidious. We shaved all our body hair, um, all the things you would do to prepare to go to, to, to Mecca um, because of the pu purification, simply that, symbolically. Um, we learned the prayers um, as best we could. We would say them to each other in the hotel at night, trying to get our head around them. Um, and then, of course, thank God, there were 300,000 other people in that place. So we could just follow them and mouth some words. Uh, and uh, and then a first AD, which we we had a tiny crew of five, five people. Um, a first AD would go with us around. Everybody's walking uh, clockwise, and he would just take over. And as he walked past us, he would just whisper action, and we would start our dialogue um, because we had tiny little mics on, and the three hundred millimeter lens on the roof would film us very wide. Um, and uh, we do the lines and then stop and then con continue to be the, do the prayer with everybody, just meld right back in. Pretty wild. Yeah. Was it weird to be like in the middle of this religious experience with all these people? And it was terrifying yeah. to me. <laughs> I was terrified of being uh, uh, of being the imposter which I was, and I knew they were going to be, they were very, very strict about it. it there was nothing beautiful about it. <laughs> it was mm. just terrifying. Oh, I'm I sorry. Really... I didn't know. I had no <laughs> idea you'd been through all this. How dreadful. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We went through it. And there were, there were five of us, a wonderful cameraman, um, mm. who was our director, uh, BBC cameraman. I can't remember his name. He's late. He, he died in a plane crash. He had nine lives, this guy. He lost his arm in, a, in an oh, explosion. No. He, no, he he was a freelance guy. He was a freelance cameraman. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, I mean, he, he, um, he, but he's an yeah. amazing, lovely guy. And he took mm. us there. Very good. But charismatic. he had, yeah, he'd been at every revolution and every he, war. You know, he there. lost he, an arm in because he was working on this film. And there was a huge explosion in Addis Ababa when a munitions dump went up and he lost yeah. an arm and he learned yeah. how to... He had a yeah, remote thing on his... He learned uh, how to uh, operate a camera. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And he was he, Rod, myself, a first AD and a guy from the ministry, right. a cult, the Ministry of Culture uh, wow. in Saudi Arabia. And the guy from the ministry was arrested after three days. So we just alone. And um, uh, we didn't we didn't hear from him again, mm. um, and uh, so we just started to busk. And thank goodness, um, uh, um, our, the the director was much was was really good at getting around. He was a journalist by trade, um, and he could deal with 
problems and he just kept we just kept moving from hotel to hotel um so that no one would catch up with us and then we just filmed by day and got the hell out mm. amazing really really terrifying now the most of the footage was unusable we shot it again in Hugh, did you have any idea that that was uh, going to be an issue when you wrote that scene? Well, I didn't really think about those things. I mean, I, you know, this is the writers, <laughs> you know, you, you, you're just a smug <laughs> writer. You just think, well, look, yeah. you know, I've written this brilliant scene. It's your problem now. You know, I didn't really I'm think... I'm going to set this scene on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I no. didn't really... I can't remember now what's in the script, actually, as to what I... whether I actually said there would be a scene of Yusuf actually, you know, going, circling the stone or, or not. I, but I, I probably did, just thinking, oh, I just hope there's some way to achieve this. But I don't yeah. think I probably understood then how risky it was. I don't, I, I don't think I did understand that, to be honest. Well, you gave us a wonderful life experience because we did every bit of, of, of mm. the Hajj. Mm. We learned every bit and it was fascinating wow. to do. We went, we threw the stones, we walked from the pillar to the pillar. You know, we did every single element. Mm -hmm. um in a mini hajj called umrah um rachel let's have you jump in here and ask your question great thanks um actually something you said earlier makes me want to sort of broaden the scope of the question um so there just there seem to be a, a range of possible interpretations of various characters so you you described david the american missionary as a sweet man but sorry cat's an idiot um <laughs> But a lot of us got the impression that he was arrogant and didn't actually care that much about what the recipients of his mission needed. Um, but yeah, that he was just kind of self-centered and, and lacking in genuine empathy. So I mean, ask... I could answer that straight away. I think that's very interesting. I mean, I think he certainly, okay. I, th I thought him as being very naive um, and stump and rather kind of remote from the people that he, although he genuinely believed he was, I think he does genuinely believe he's bringing them the message. Do you see what I mean? But I think, yeah. I think your criticism of him is, is, he, is, he, is certainly valid, you know, and of course it leads to his destruction in a way because he just goes crashing into things. And you know, there's that thing, I think, I don't know if I should say this, but I think sometimes Americans are genuinely astonished to find people don't like them when they arrive in other countries, you know, because they always think, hey, look, I'm come here to help you. And someone will say, look, we didn't ask for this. Do you see what I mean? And I think that's, perhaps that's what's going on rather in, in, in that character and that organization. I don't mind interjecting for a second. I thought that that was one of the amazing things that you pulled off in, in the piece, um, is to to get to make to get that complex that layering in there because the American the mission the even the, the evangelical mission, um, as as you, as you say, is a kind of monolithic financial political force, um, and it's it bigger than the 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 some of its parts the, the the very people who who actually make the who the individuals who who make who are the missionaries who are the the, the people with empathy perhaps don't realize that they're working for something that is inherently crooked it you cannot possibly keep you cannot it's counter religious mm. um when you have to be political to raise money to do the thing that you need to do to get into the access that you need and to make the friends that you need to be able to distribute the, the kind of goodwill that you'd like to distribute by the time it's been through that sausage mm. machine mm. you've just got garbage coming out <laughs> yeah and i think it is actually right i think he i think i'm perhaps you know it's a long time ago and i read it and or i wrote it and, and although i viewed it very recently i think i'm forgetting that when he when he starts to tell martha that she mustn't try and talk to Mengistu and she shouldn't do this and she should do that, then I think that side of him is there actually. I think you're quite right. You know, he, he does become rather kind of arrogant and, and, and he becomes, he's caught up in, in the, as you say, he's caught up in the politics of his position and it's blinding him to, to the real risks to people. You know? So he says, I don't worry about 
don't worry about the driver, you know, Hailu, don't care, don't worry about him now, you know, well, Hailu ends up getting tortured, you know, so I think, it's, I think you're right, and I was, I, he, there's more to him than being sweet. <laughs> I, I actually had a, I had a similar question, or I started mm. with a question um, about Gil, because there was also agreement among people who participated in the viewings about whether we were meant to find him sympathetic and whether we should see his sort of moral awakening, I guess, at the end as sincere or lasting. And then just to sort of throw another, another character that there was um, disagreement about into the mix, there were, there were also differing levels of sympathy for Yusuf's father at the end. Mm. Um, so, I mean, death of the author and all that, like not to say that your perspective is authoritative, but it, um, it is a piece of evidence uh, to take into account in, in interpretation. So I'd be interested in how you viewed the characters or thought that we should view the characters. Yeah, I mean, I think I try to have characters who are complicated you know, and that have good sides and bad sides. I suppose that's, that's key for me, really. And therefore, people may, some people will perhaps focus on the good side and other people might focus on the bad side. Do you see what I mean? Um, and I think that's true of, of um, David, the, the, and I think there is a, a side to him which is being kind of compromised very severely by wanting to be in there and, have the sort of political clout that he wants. Um, uh, I think Yosef's father is, yes, of course. I mean, Yosef's father is, he's right to warn, oh, it's the cat, yes, sorry. he's right, he's right to warn <laughs> um, Yosef that Yosef's playing with fire. He's right and he's true. And Yosef should have taken his advice really and realized that if you're messing with these evangelicals, there's going to be trouble kind of thing. But on the other hand, he also was a man who did a terrible thing. He abandoned his daughter and left her, you know. And he, and then in the end, he goes, he goes kind of crazy, really. I mean, richly crazy, because he's overwhelmed by his own grief and his sense of helplessness. Um, so I, I want my characters to be, to have more than one side to them, you know. Um, as for Giel, yeah, I mean, I don't think, He's just, you know, he's been, you know, he's, he's in a war and, and soldiers in wars will end up doing terrible things that they can never live with, you know, and, and he's just another one, really. I mean, he shot somebody. He's, he's probably beaten people. He's probably done awful things because that's what you're expected to do in those situations. So I don't think he, he's, we may feel sorry for him because of how he's been damaged by what he's done, but he's, he wasn't prepared to go to prison. You, if you don't go in the army, you go to prison in, in Israel. Um, they don't acknowledge, I don't think they acknowledge any idea of conscientious objection, which is something that was developed in Britain very diff with great difficulty during World War II. And it was accepted that some people would have passionate religious reasons. Whereas in fact, I think the hardest line people in Israel don't go in the army. The, the really very strict Jewish people don't, they won't fight in the army. Um, and they're allowed to do that. But that's part of the huge complexity of what religious faith is in, in Israel, and the different branches and the antagonisms between them. But it, what is it like when you write, obviously you write lots of characters and it's wonderful to see actors inhabit those characters and they come to life. And it's one of the great pleasures of being a, a screenwriter, I imagine, yeah. um, of just, you know, these oh, black and white words become these mm. oh, things. Mm. Generally speaking, I think that I like to believe, and tell me if I'm wrong, that my dialogue kind of has a certain way in which it, it, it suggests how you, how you go, what it means, how you, how you go about it. But it's, not, it's not just sort of so neutral that you can play it 23 different ways. It's, it kind of has a certain... I hope yeah, it does, anyway. it's, it's a specific, yeah, it's, it, it, it's a shape. 
Mm. Yes, it has a shape to it. You've got to, mm. you can't, yeah, work against it. You've got to let that, that, mm. that do its thing, which is very interesting, um, mm. really. And it was kind of interesting that one of the choices, I don't know if people noticed how my character, um, there was one scene, the first scene we shot, which I think is in the second episode, um, is um, I use a, an Arabic accent. And for the rest of the show, I dropped it. And they, oh, right. we didn't re we didn't re do the voice again to, to clean that up. We just left it as an Arabic. He's got an Arabic accent in one scene, and then all oh, the rest he goes back. How to wonderful! British I hadn't noticed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, watch it's very again. obvious. Very obvious. We actually interpreted that as a deliberate choice. I mean, some of us were saying, "Oh, that's really interesting that you." Did it's that. accommodation that you know that people actually do change. Yeah, well, that was very, it's, very cool of you to do that. But that's actually, that was the uncertainty of being a, the, the, the actor on the day. And then the powers that be saying, you know what, get rid of the accent. And you're like, all right. <laughs> yeah. I remember, you, I'm glad you noticed it. We read it as code switching is what it's called now. So, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, yeah, I do it naturally as a, as a, Sid does it all the time. I'm changing my accent subtly and depending on who <laughs> I'm around. <laughs> um, but that was a big change. <laughs> well, you know, my my favourite line that I, I gave to you uh, as Yusuf was um, was that one way when, when you say when people ask me where I come from and I say Birmingham, I know that's not the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I laughed out loud when I heard you that. that. <laughs> yeah. Birmingham is not the right answer. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> Because um, I, I mean, perhaps you may not know, but actually now there's a huge Muslim population in Birmingham. I mean, when you go there, it's just teeming with these all these energetic young Muslim people. It's it's lovely. You know, because yeah. I lived there for yeah. years. You know, uh, I was living uh, there when I wrote this. Actually, that's why I, I put all those scenes oh, in Birmingham. That's why you put it in Birmingham. Absolutely. Yeah, I watched them building the, the conference center. Okay. Can we, can we have something uh. like this? You know. Mm. <laughs> so that brings up the question, Hugh, of um, mm. how much real world, how many real world events and um, maybe attitudes were you drawing from when you were yeah. writing this? Yeah, actually, I, 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 I just thought about this. And, uh, you know, for instance, um, as I think I said, there was a, 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 a cleric who committed suicide over this terrible row. Uh, he was editing the church magazine. So I, I created the editor character who comes to Sturridge to warn him. Um, but that actually happened and, and I used that. Um, I also used the, um, and then I said the property developer who told me that someone would attack a building and, and the grenade thing was something that I found had really happened. Yeah, and the, the involvement of, of, the Ameri of the American government in, in evangelical organizations having having part of how they're using them to bring back intelligence and bring back information um, that's all that was all research um, house churches were a big new thing at that time and I discovered that there were such things as spiritual centers I think in a way I probably should have called it a multi-faith center because it's it's, it's a mistake I didn't realize but there are lots of these spirit places where they're spiritualists who believe in communicating with the dead. And that's not Yusuf <laughs> at all. So I should probably have called it a multi-faith center. And there are such places. And then of course, there was the real case of Terry Waite trying to free hostages in Lebanon. So I had this idea already in, in reality of a priest saying, let me get in there, I'll do something. And that was a really crucial crib from reality into the drama. Just explain for those who don't mm. know who Terry Waite was, because we've got a lot of people under 50 here. But he really? was a. Uh, <laughs> Good heavens! Yeah. <laughs> he was, yeah. I think he was like the, the, the Archbishop of uh, the, the Canterbury's personal assistant or something yes, like that. He was quite a senior figure. Yes. Yeah, he, he was a, he absolutely an administrator thought, I can do of the it. church. Yeah, and he and went he into Lebanon. Kidnapped. And he got, yeah, he went in to try and talk the. the um, Hezbollah people into releasing the hostages and they ended up taking him captive as well and he did like another two or three years there it was yeah, a horrendous not. situation uh, he was trying to rescue this journalist there were 
like three or four hundred people were taken hostage in Lebanon over this. It was the civil war which had been triggered by the invasion of Israel, I think. And yeah. a lot of them died in captivity. And there was this huge issue about how do you get people out? You know, so this obviously did, I think, feed into big bats. Mm. Yeah, you sent a, a lot of us to Google many times while we were watching what was going on. Did that actually happen? What? Um, and the, the end of the uh, Ethiopian civil war was another thing that we were Googling yes. there at the end. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That was a huge tragedy at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Rose, you had a question. I study film music and I was really intrigued by the musical oh, yeah. score. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that it incorporated um, incorporated different, you know, religious influences, um, especially mm -hmm. as I'm teaching music history now and having to teach about the history of Christian church music. So I was curious if you were part of any of the conversations with the composer, you had any input on that aspect of the show, the music. Um, no, quick answer, no, I didn't. Um, this was um, Brian Eastman, the producer, has very strong ideas about music and how it should be. And he went to a very good um, composer who has also composed, you know, um, whole concertos and, you know, major sort of chamber music. So he's a really sort of serious classical composer as well as doing film music. And I think he had a pretty good budget. So he, you know, he used quite, you know, he used singers and, and, and he did a lot of research to, to sort of blend different you know, to the different faiths and their kind of musics together. Um, uh, I, I do worry because um, Brian Eastman does have a thing about kind of bringing up the theme every time the particular character comes on screen. And I yeah, do lots something. of light motifs. Yeah, and I thought, oh, come on, let's ease up on this. But that's all done in in editing and post production, and I'm I'm just not involved in any of that. And um, but I do know that directors have found that a problem sometimes, producers who very much want themes to be repeated to sort of underlying characters and so on. But I mean, my, <laughs> one of my very first films, I just asked a friend of mine to compose the music because you could do that. And um, it was a, I did an adaptation of To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf, which is at the moment still unavailable. I won't bore you with all the rights issues have led to that. But he wrote, I thought, wonderful music because he'd never written film music before. He just kind of said, oh, what am I going to do? You know, and it's just fabulous because it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it sort of breaks the rules in a very interesting way. And, and I thought it's mm. very powerful, but it's really, it's, it's, it's quite strong. It's a strong element and, and some people may not have liked it. But the music for Big Battalions, I do think is beautiful actually. I think that, yeah, it is. that singing is, is, is so beautiful at the beginning. You know, there's a lovely shot of the, all the angels' faces on the ceiling of the, um, of the monastery. You know. um, it's just, just love it. Well, we've covered quite a lot of ground here. Um, we do have a few yeah. more minutes if somebody wants to jump in with another question that we haven't addressed yet. I've got a quick question. I was just wondering if there was any character that you really struggled to write. You know, I mean, you can sometimes quite easily have two characters who terribly much dislike each other and have humding a row, son, row scenes, which I had between these two clerics who were in, locked in argument, you know. And it was painful because it was a friendship that's gone wrong, really, you know. But other times, I sometimes think my characters are all being a bit too nice, you know, they're being a little too reasonable, you know. And I've sometimes seen drama, which I really admire, where characters are grotesquely unreasonable. And it's, on, it's either very frightening or it's very funny. But it's quite nice sometimes. <laughs> Val, did you have a question? I did. It was a question about Edward. You said that you didn't write it so that he was the person that everything rotated around. But I kind of felt like he was. He was the one guy that had connections in, in all the places of, you know, his machinations are the reason that the uh, spiritual center was not there and his daughter was in Israel and his wife was in Ethiopia and him being kind of a giant jackass to everyone is <laughs> a lot of what caused most of this the the not great things to occur so I was just wondering how how that meshes with how you said that is it was not your intention and how that ended up kind of being 
my well i mean obviously you can't read my mind but like that was my perception was that edward was the central character well it's interesting i mean i in a way um it's increasingly the case now that every everyone wants to have a central character in a film uh, and i'd rather resist that so in fact um what I, uh, the way i saw hoyland is that actually he becomes increasingly impotent and ineffectual as as we get deeper into the drama. And once he goes to Ethiopia, he really doesn't know what he's doing and he doesn't achieve anything much. Everything that's happened there was nothing to do with him anyway. It's just happened because of the politics, because of Martha getting too involved and so on and so forth. And, and so by the end, I think he becomes, he, he's, he's lost everything. I mean, he's, he's never going to be achieved the, the, the archdeacon role that he wanted. He's been ineffectual. His wife has damned him. Um, his daughter has, he's fallen out with everyone and he becomes quite a sad figure. So you could argue that he's the central character. I, I can see that. But I think for me, I wanted a piece to turn round Yosef's kind of hopes and dreams of a religion, of a, of a sort of beautiful religion and not a harsh religion. Um, so that's why I want to, by the time we, it's very important, I think, to me, how a film ends. And a film ends, Hoyland's gone. He's not there for those very beautiful sort of moment right at the end in the memorial service. So I, I sort of see what you're saying, but I, I'm, I challenge it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Yusuf was definitely the soul of the, the piece, mm. but mm. Um, the, that Brian is such a the, as the actor Brian Cox is such mm -hmm. a force of nature. He is. Yeah. He's such a, a pro, was such an appropriate actor for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's such a whirlwind, and he's so malevolent. You know, mm -hmm. that um, he's, I mean, he's so good at playing that male malevolence. Mm -hmm. He's a sort of Lear, King Lear. You know that the power is all there. Um, mm -hmm. He's just disappearing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I think it was quite brave, actually, having mumbled about casting, but I think it was a very brave decision to cast somebody like him to play a, yeah. uh, uh, a senior cleric in the church. Yeah. Yes, it was risky. It was risky casting, but I think he brings it off. I thought he did a tremendous oh, yeah. job. Um, Jimmy. Hello. Um, well, I was going to ask uh, what you regret or what you'd do differently, um, but I think I'd <laughs> rather be positive. So for Hugh and for Sid, um, what are you happiest with about it? What are you most proud of in the whole procedure and reception and everything to do with the series? I'll jump in first because it's, much, it's a much easier question for me. Um, I'm, I'm now 35 years away from making it. And looking back on it, um, I thought the, that I'm very proud of the fact that um, it, the character was, seemed honest. He, he seemed like the appropriate character for the place and time. So I'm, I'm really happy with the way he wrote it and the, the luck that I managed to, you know, not fall over the furniture the whole way through. But it was, it was great. Yeah, it was very believable and, yeah, felt like a real was, person. Yeah. Well, I suppose for me, I mean, on, to be like, honest with you, I was just, you know, it was incredible to, to have achieved it. I mean, to, to have worked on something that big, you know. Yeah. Um, that international and that sort of you know it was such a hugely ambitious thing to embark on um and i'm 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 sort of proud that we brought it off all of us you know brian and the actors and myself and director and so on um i'm just i just some the only thing i do feel is that you know because i bumped into brian cox at the film festival a few years late some many years later and he said oh he said yeah prophetic you see, and, and of course it was prophetic, but because the trouble is being prophetic is that people don't understand why you're doing what you're doing, because the reason why it's going to be prophetic hasn't been revealed yet. So <laughs> it was, I do think people said, what, what's he on about all this about religion? You know what I mean? And I do think there was a certain amount of puzzlement and I, I feel sad about, you know, I'd rather have said, if it, I'd rather have said I'm on the button rather than being pressing a button that nobody knows is noticed yet. Do you see what I mean? Yes. <laughs> so so that, that, that was, that's what I sort of regret, since is what, that was what you wanted to ask, really, wasn't it? Um, but I'm, I'm still 
thrilled that it happened. And I, 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 I'm actually I have to say through all you guys, I'm hugely determined now to try and put it somewhere. You know, it should be it should be available. It's an amazing piece. Nobody could do it. Yeah. I, I think we'd all happily watch it again. Yeah, well, that's wonderful. You know, so yeah, um, I'm hoping. I mean, Emma and Mel have been great over all this. You know, that maybe I can use some of your reactions and things, and just at least get it on on streaming service somewhere. You know, because it is it is a hell of a piece. Absolutely, it just needs cleaning up, remastering, and and it it'll, it's just it? it's wonderful. Well, I think it's totally appropriate, um, and it's it's not that expensive, and it's a, no. a relatively inexpensive, cheap twelve hours for Channel Four <laughs> to, mm. to 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 ro roll it out again, um, mm. and they can make whatever changes they wish. Well, there you go then. So Emma, <laughs> Emma Shaw and I we're working on it. We've got a we've yeah. got a plan. So. Oh. So I have actually have two questions, uh, one for Sid and one for Hugh. Um, and for Sid is because I'm a huge Deep Space Nine fan. Uh, I, I have a question, like how was it playing uh, a character of the character of Julian Bashir, uh, especially you have an Arab name in the end. And after post 9-11, I know that when you see characters like those on TV, they're generally associated with some stereotypes, but before in the 90s, how was like playing a Julian Bashir and especially a doctor in um, in, a, in a far future, you know? Yeah. Uh, how did that play out? And uh, the question for uh, Hugh is like, uh, when you were doing research for the big battalions, how much of that uh, research came from actually studying the cultures of all these religions and uh, studying the actual texts of those religions uh, because they are generally two different things uh, how people interpret it and how it is written good questions yeah you go first uh, Sid you got it um it's I I I play I played Julian Bashir very lucky to play Julian Bashir God. back in immediately after Big Tats, yeah. actually, a couple of a couple of years later and um what I loved about Bashir and what I loved about being a young Arab actor at that time was that um, I could hide. I doesn't, it wasn't important where I came from. It, mm -hmm. it, it was really important to me that it didn't matter. So, and the Federation, which is the space thing, was they didn't care. You know, the alien doesn't matter. If you're Arab, doesn't matter. So we didn't talk about his Arabness, his, 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 anything to do with him. And um, I was very proud of that. Um, but after 9-11, the whole world changed mm. and I had to stand for something. And I, I became, I couldn't avoid my identity any longer. So I was much more Muslim, much more Arab, much more everything, much more brown. Mm. And um, wow. that became really, really important because we had to look after each other, look after, we were um, Arab people were hated after that at that point and uh, so I was lucky enough to find parts that helped me do things that said hey hey no some some of us are nice and in fact most of us are <laughs> and there are only some of us that are horrible so uh, that was became my mission at that point um, and we're still kind of in that world yeah well it's interesting um yes yeah, so, uh, uh sorry just to answer, answer your question I mean no I didn't I didn't really get involved in the in religious texts and things for this because it was about how it was playing out in the lives of people really i mean the, the, that as a dramatist uh, it's i mean I'm, my work is very very grounded in characters really and and so it's it's these people making these people real to me how are they how are they experiencing these conflicts how are they drawn or repelled by religious experiences or religious people they encounter so you know the really important thing for me is like when Yusuf goes to the mosque and asks this man and, and he says well look I'm telling you your world is centered somewhere and it isn't here you know and and sets him off on his journey which is to go to Mecca and to try and understand this faith that's been kept back from him you see so those it's those encounters that are so important Similarly, you know, he's 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 on this sort of journey through the through the film until disaster until he hits disaster is and, and the Palestinian says, Look, 
you've got a British passport. I mean, don't you realize how powerful that is, that thing you've got in your hand? Use it, you know, go there, see your mother, you know. And these are sort of, this is a classic sort of Hollywood stuff, actually. You, know, you have your journey and you have your encounters with people who move you along to the next thing. I'm always very worried. I do worry whether I've got things right, you know, in dealing with these things, because um, in some ways it might seem quite superficial, but it, it's never meant to be. It's more that I, I can't sort of drown in those things. I'm trying to, as I say, it's the characters and, and that I'm working with, I'm thinking about. My starting point was more about, I think, as I've been saying, the relationship between individuals and big forces, which are sometimes part of what they think of as, as faith. Thanks. Mm. Thanks, Anas. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody, Thank you. for your, your interesting questions and discussions. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate Hugh for coming and joining us. Hugh, <laughs> you have been spectacular. Um, it's been <laughs> such a pleasure. Thank you so much. This is, you've been so generous to talk about all of this and, 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 and everything else. And of course, it leads to all sorts of other things. Really, well, I'm sure really I've wonderful. done an awful lot of talking, and I'm sorry if lots of people are frustrated they haven't had, been able to ask questions. So I apologize if that's the case. But we just... no, we'll we'll continue the chat without you if we have to. Oh, good. So if anyone's got questions, we'll we'll get to them next week. <laughs> Quick uh, update for everybody. I know I said last week that I had an estimate of how much um, these screenings had raised, and I do have the final tally now. We were able to donate seven hundred and ten dollars and sixteen cents. Um, and that's that was, fantastic. That yeah. is split between the film and TV charity in uh, the UK and Amnesty International, which is uh, what Hugh chose. So thank you to everyone who so generously contributed Brilliant. to that. We really appreciate that. And that will go in the packet of information that goes to Channel 4 so that they can see that people will put money out for this. <laughs> oh, might might you. help grease the wheels a little bit. It certainly will. Brilliant. That's really, really good. Yeah.